Giant Poo. The Giant Poo's still down here. For those of you who missed the Giant Poo, here it is. Just holding it up again. All six pounds of polymer coated poo. Just holding it up. That's it. Howdy, it's me, Manic Mark, coming to you from the bunker system located underneath the Art Villa Found, somewhere in the jungles of the Midwest. And today is record day. It's not too bad. Went to, uh, I only go to one place now. Uh, it's just getting older in the time. It's not there like it used to be. Um, I stopped going to some of the thrifts because it's just, you know. Anyway, uh, a, few, a record store or two I go to. But that's not neither here nor there. Today was just uh, half price books, and I, I, I drove up and I got there, you know, um, pretty early after they opened, and there was a guy standing there at the records. I'm like, oh man, this is why I came early. And then. So I go in, and I, then I get my little stool, and I sit down at the cheap bin, and almost a quarter of all the records are it's empty. I've never seen it like that. Okay, And in half price books, many of the albums that they feel are worth something, uh, those bins are filled with uh, reissues, you know. Um, they must be pay paying so little money, which, you know, whenever I've taken records in, you, they don't give you anything <laughs> for them, basically. They leave you kind of in shock. What? you got to be kidding me. Uh, <clears throat> but that's got to be the reason. Maybe the word is out, you know, people. Only if, you know, your aunt dies and you're like, what? What are these things? Or albums. Well, who'd want them? You, you know, you look it up. And, and, it, and the problem is, here's the problem. The problem is when you take, at least here, I'm just speaking from my own experience. Um, there was one guy, Mike, he's gone, he passed away. But he would take everything, okay? So I learned from him that if I ran a record store and somebody brought in records, I would take them all, you know, and give them something for everything. And it didn't have to be a lot, but most people would like, they're heavy. They bring them in, they want to get rid of them. They don't want to take any of them home, okay? So even if you have to throw them out, oh, I know you hate to hear that, but that's why these guys' record places, they don't, they just want to cherry pick, and people don't like that, you know? So, that you know, if they're, you know, somebody that's going to come in more than once on a rare occasion is, you know, probably not going to um, come back with anything, right? Um, so they're just going to take the stuff to half price books. Then they take everything and we give you nothing for it. Now the record stores don't have to be that bad, and they could do um, trade and all that kind of stuff. So, but the the, the point the point is is that to build reputation at, right out of the box, the record store. I think it, I think <laughs> it would be a good idea to take everything and then whatever you can't use, throw it away, or give it away, or put it in a box and somebody will just take it. All right. Um, put it in front of the store. All oh, record stores used to do that. Didn't they have a free box out front? Anyway, I think it just builds good client relations. And uh, you give people trade and you work with them and make them feel like they got a deal and um, you build people will come. And uh, But m m most of them are not like... One of my favorite... I went to this shop that's been in town forever, okay? I didn't even know it was still open. I heard it was open. I went there. And um, there was a front room and a back room, and I looked through stuff in the front room, and the prices seemed a little high. I went in the back room, looking around, didn't really see anything, but there were stacks of records underneath the shelves. They weren't covered up, there were no tarps on them, there was, you know, they were just there. And I had spent like 45 minutes looking through these boxes, that, and it should have dawned on me there were no prices on them. So I found like three or four records, and I took them up, and I said, well, how much are these? They're in boxes in the back, but I couldn't, you know. Oh, no, those aren't for sale. I'm like, oh, God. Well, let me take your name and phone number, and we'll call you back. Mm -hmm. So in two weeks, the phone rings. I don't pick it up, and there's a message. Hey, this is so-and-so from, and uh, one record you want, uh, $20, like it was a local gospel album. And they, they just, they think they, they saw me coming, but they didn't. I'm like, So uh, I never went back there. It, that was not a good experience. So don't put stuff out that's not for sale. Price stuff. The other thing that that's, I don't like is when something's not priced, and you take it up and you're like, oh, I, I need to look that up. And they go online to look it up. You know, just deal with 
the person right then and there and get rid of the record. You could, you know, as a, you know, don't go on and on and on. And, I mean, I, it's, the temptation when you're young is to like do everything, look up everything online and come up, you know, with the price and all that. But maybe that's not the best idea. Maybe the best idea is to move records and to make people feel good when they bring records into you and then just to keep the turnover going, you know? Anyway, but what do I know? I don't know anything. I never run a record store, so why are you going into all this? I don't... It doesn't matter. So, but my whole point of going through that whole thing, I think I might just speed it up. That part that I sped up, I sped it up just because it went on too long, and I just decided to speed the whole thing up. That part right there. So, half-price books, they don't have anything anymore. It's all... Um, repressings, and I personally not interested. I'd rather have a scratchy record, original scratchy record, or I would buy just a, a CD, I guess, or an MP3 or something like that, which I, I don't do, but I would. That's what I would do. Every now and then, rarely, I bought uh, Sun Raw because you can't find any hip stuff anywhere. I bought uh, a, a double CD that was just released of Sun Raw stuff, which is pretty awesome, but it's rare for me to do. Um, but it's, so half price books, their problem is they take everything, but they don't pay enough. You know, they could still pay twice what they pay when they take a box of records, at least twice, and I think still make a profit. And people would, the word would get around, people would bring records in, and they would have more stock. There, I said it. Glad I sped up that other part. It went on for way too long. Okay, few, <laughs> few, few oddities. Um, St Stormy Weekend by the Mystic Moods. Uh, I thought I'd had I would found all their albums, but here's one I don't have, and it's curious in that it's it's got a die cut on the front, and there's a printed sleeve. Hey, let's see if that's spicy. How spicy is that? Oh, well, isn't that interesting? Oh, I didn't even look at it at the record store, but there's nakedness on the sleeve. Yeah, that's that's wild. 1975. Huh. Okay then. Well, that's interesting. Well, the Mystic Boots, um, the guy, and you know, here I am again, trying to figure out what the hell, because I don't remember anything. Uh, one of the first pop, or maybe the first, or some, the first that doing something with environmental music, they sound. They went out and recorded rain and storms and birds and city sounds and junk like that and blended it into pop music, mood music. But it's not annoying. It's sometimes it's like takes you from track to track. It fades into a track, fades out. Sometimes it's all the way through. Sometimes the record sounds kind of like one whole big um, mood sort of, and the arrangements are, you know, good. And, and I, I, they're creative. I like, for what they are, they're cr a creative set of records uh, by, done by the Mystic Woods. So most of them, and this one, that's a no. Got the naked, the naked mystic moods. That's got to be worth millions. This was a fun find. It's cheap, cheap budget. Halo, the Halo label, rock and roll. Okay, um, featuring Louis Prima. Now, is he actually on the record? I don't know because it says played by America's All Star Groups. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. That means like studio sessions, right? Or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's actual, actual tracks from actual. Uh, all-star groups, oh, but nonetheless, hmm. I don't know about that. Probably not. Probably not. Let's set that aside because I'm going on like way too long. And it's a David Carroll I probably have, but I picked it up again because it was this was minty fresh and it's a fun uh, uh, cover, fun cover. David Carroll, he made some good records too, by the way. Don't sell them short. Introspect, Joe South, just happened to be in the bin. Uh, this is a nice cover, ABC Paramount, early. Uh, I like the name, Tara Lay, okay, uh, and her singing guitar. It's folk songs. Uh, but she does, uh, sometimes I feel like a motherless child on here, and I would, I'd be interested to hear her take on that. Uh, I don't know. There's a Baja Marimba uh, album I, I, I've never seen before uh, for animals only. So basically the theme is uh, covers of animal songs like Puff the Magic Dragon, which will be interesting. Interest, I will find interest. It's Vic Dana on the Liberty sub-label uh, Dalton. All right. 
Uh, I picked this up because he does a cover of Yesterday, the Beatles Yesterday. Real cheap percussion on Grand Prix, Grand Prix here label. Which it's they it's, he did a session and then every budget label took it and put a cover on it, trying to copy the command label. This is horrible. This is a horrible cover. That's why I picked it up because the the graphic design, the design quality of the cover is so bad that it really impressed me and I had to pick it up. It's Indianapolis, Indiana, so it's local lounge, doing covers of music to watch a girl walk by, music to watch girls by. I don't know if they're walking or not. That's that's neither here nor there. Um, what else is on here? Michelle, another Beatles cover. That could be the sample right there. It's a Mundo Gross record I've got. Uh, but I don't know if I've got a clean cover. I recognize the cover. I think this record's sort of obscure for him. Uh, but it's nice, kind of a nice uh, shoe fetish uh, cover. If you happen to, you know, have one of those, you'd probably want to go look for this album. Hmm. No! <laughs> no, the only shoe fetish I have is to find shoes that actually fit my feet. <laughs> then I'm like, oh, I'm excited when that happens. Oh my god, they fit my feet. Stand back. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> sing and trumpet. Oh no, trumpets don't sing, do they? Well, apparently they do. Uh, when Rafael Mendez plays them, I've got this, but I, I wanted to save it from being trashed. It's a kind of a cheap gatefold. Thin, thin, jackety thing. Uh, it's, it's you know, based on the Mrs. Robinson deal, you know. It's supposed to, like, oh, there I am. I like the young, the young men. Uh, that was, the, like, the first cougar, right, Mrs. Robinson? I mean, the, the movie cougar type. Just some of those songs, Mrs. Robinson. Anyway... Uh, it's the Richard uh, King Richard Fugel Knights, oh, right? That was it, his real name, King Richard. Um, there's not a photograph of him on this. There is a photograph of him on a, on another on one of his other albums. Okay, uh, but he, two, two, the two, three of uh, four of them he made under the pseudonym. Is that the right word? Uh, King Richard are pretty good. So they're kind of covers a pop song, kind of like the now sound, uh, but the arrangements are quirky. And they're quirky. That's it. The arrangements are quirky, which makes them good albums. Uh, I, I like them. I uh, picked up this one. I don't know I might have let this one sit in the bin for two or three weeks, but I finally picked it up because I uh, read a little bit of the back cover. See, there's there's the woman on it that sings. You know, it's just going to be pretty white bread stuff. But just just I just read this. It said during the past twelve years, Evelyn, and that's the photograph I just showed you. That's Evelyn. Evelyn has had a multitude of physical ailments and mental anguish. You know, now, if I put that kind of thing, you know, on my, to sell my artwork, people are like, oh, no, look, the artwork's crazy, he's crazy, I don't have anything to do with him. Because, why? Because there's nothing spiritually uplifting about what you do. Oh. I left that component out of all my work. <laughs> That's the first time I have a mistake. Then, continue on with... Um, the religious records, this happened to be in the bin, um, it's a, a sermon record. Look at the cover there, Relation 666. You're starting to go, oh, yeah, it's not bad. And the beast from the sea, the beast from the sea. Apparently there's some Re Revelations 13, 1-10. Um, there's a reference to the beast from the sea. I, I don't, I've never heard of that, but maybe there is. Okay, but, well, Jim is a former shipbuilding executive who late who in late autumn of 1973 had a UFO experience on the Gulf Coast of the United States near Pasca, Mississippi, Pasca. They were ready to fire him and begin to travel around the country in what he describes as a missionary zeal trying to make the public aware of the real presence of UFOs. Mr. Jim uh, maintains that the U.S. government has been involved in a cosmic Watergate for the past 25 years. But what the hell's on this one? If you were astounded by the UFO message, you'll be shocked by Revelation 666. Unlocking many secrets of the past and providing an unbelievable prediction for the future. Unbelievable predictions! Most of them are unbelievable, I must say. So he's not, you know, this is not false advertising. UFOs! Is the Earth, is the Earth in danger from UFOs? That's on here too. Cha-ching!